Okay, ready. Okay, welcome to the Q&A in the evening. And the first question is from Susie. Mm -hmm. Can I say that? Well, you don't have from to say name. From somebody. Fear okay. and anxiety come up whenever the peace and stillness gets mm -hmm. really strong. It stops the meditation going deeper. What can I do? Thank you. I'd also like to add that I am really enjoying this retreat. Oh, thank you. So am I. And the way to overcome the fear and anxiety is to do that programming mindfulness stuff. When you start to meditate and you begin the meditation uh, hour or whatever, you tell your mind, if fear and anxiety come up, I will not um, pay attention to it. When fear and anxiety come up, I'll not pay attention to it. When fear or anxiety come up, I will not pay attention to it. And then when you make that um, instruction, you get really peaceful, really still. Now all fear and anxiety start to try and invade your mind, but the um, programming you just did stops it. So you can enjoy the meditation much better. And also, please know that I, I know my stuff when it comes to meditation. There's nothing to fear at all from deep meditation. It's totally safe. It's very healthy. It's very good for no matter what you're going through in your life. It's 100% positive. You get wonderful states of mind afterwards. You get wonderful health afterwards. And sometimes after deep meditation, it's weird. I feel I come out and I feel I could run the London Marathon and win it. That's the energy you have. Fantastic. But I must add that there is one danger in getting into deep meditation. I've got to be honest with you. And that one danger is you may lose your hair. <laughs> In other words, you know, you want to become a monk or a nun or something because it's just so beautiful, so wonderful. You think, oh, why not? So, but there's no real reason for fear and anxiety. Can I do that one? You can do that one. So I'll do this next one. I'll no, do that one. Right. Which, which one are you going to do? I'm going to do that one. Okay. After the one before then. Uh, all right. Okay. I read somewhere that the Pali word chitta can not only be translated as mind, but as also as heart. Could you comment on this? The chitta also means something beautiful. If anybody has visited Malaysia, especially the north of Malaysia, there's even a town called Chitra. That's a Pali, that's a Sanskrit form of chitta. So it also means like beautiful. And that was uh, as a Thai prince, and Prince Chitra sort of invaded many centuries ago and he created that city. But meaning mind or heart, sometimes uh, even in the modern day, we sometimes call mind or heart or consciousness. We don't use these words um, like lawyers do, or like professors do. Ordinary people use these words um, just quite vaguely. And there's one part, and this is the Brahmajana Sutta, and this is wrong view number eight. And in wrong view number eight of the Brahmajana Sutta, there the Buddha says, that which people call mind, citta, or heart, and I usually call that, uh, what do they call the heart there? I do, anyway. Or man, oh no, or mano, or vinyana. Vinyana means consciousness. What, what they call that, if they say that that is permanent and lasts you know, after death, after nibbana, then that's wrong view. It's wrong view number eight. You check it out for yourself if you wish. But the interesting part there, was the Buddha said what they call this or that or that. It's the same thing they're calling. But we use words um, not so rigidly. The Buddha was not a lawyer. 
and people aren't lawyers and we have to speak the language of the locals. So yes, it can be translated as mind or as heart, but the heart is not such a common and accurate description. Mind or consciousness or my mental consciousness, that's what it's usually translated as. Is it this process of due to that is rebirth? What happens is the jitta, uh, this uh, mind, if you want to call it, once you know, the uh, death moment happens, the five senses stop. That is one of the reasons why that you know, even today, doctors you know, would put a, a flashlight in somebody's eye to see if there's any reaction or they were to speak in their ear to see if there's any reaction. Death is very, very hard to define if you're a doctor. Yes, you can see that someone's dead, or you can see that they're alive. The actual moment you know, when you can call somebody dead is really indeterminate. So anyway, you can say it's when the five senses stop working. And as I mentioned again and again, the five senses are not everything, you've got the sixth sense as well. And that sixth sense of mind can be independent of the five senses. It can take the five sense objects as its own object, but it can also be independent. And when it comes to the time of death, we have this wonderful phenomena, which I always like talking about, Terminal lucidity. Terminal lucidity means that the last you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, or even an hour or so of your, your last moments, even though you were in a coma, or this one case I read about, there was a fellow who had, uh, he had a tumor in his brain, and the tumor just colonized all the usual parts of the brain until there was no brain left, just the tumor. So the doctor said what would happen, he would just go into similar to a coma and then whatever parts of the brain were left will be struggling to keep the basic bodily functions like heart and uh, basically the heart beating and then it would stop. So he would go unconscious like a comatose. But then with the doctor in attendance and the doctor reported this phenomena in the last hour or so of his, uh, of his life, this man with a brain tumor opened his eyes, recognized all the people around him, all of the close relations, and had a nice conversation with them. The doctor couldn't believe what he was seeing, but it was there, it was real. It's what we call terminal lucidity. What happens there is the brain is shot, it's kaput, it doesn't work anymore and the mind takes over. This mind is separate from the brain. And terminal lucidity is one of those um, phenomena which does happen, not all the time, but many times. I think when I was giving a talk on this in Singapore, uh, the uh, Singapore National U University, and I think it was in the medical center. And I asked just the audience, how many of you have witnessed this? And about a third of them, doctors and nurses involved in palliative care, put their hands up, they'd witnessed terminal lucidity. When a person was talking, was recognizing people, was using those higher uh, mental functions when they shouldn't have been able to. So this is why when a person dies, the mind continues on. The process is not stopped. And because that process, process keeps on working after death, that's where you get things like ghosts and spirits from. And that's why that process can go and seek a new birth, seek some more um, life in front of it. And if you don't believe me, wait till you die. <laughs> okay. That's why I always say, if you don't believe in rebirth, you will in your next life. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. Being a gen and venerable, is disengagement from the world necessary for the mind to fully embrace meditation? Thank you. So this brings to mind again a wonderful sutta called Arana Vibhanga Sutta in the Majjhima 139, or is it 149? I think it's 139. And um, the Buddha is not saying disengagement from the world completely, because even monks and nuns are engaged to some extent. And, and sometimes to a great extent, but what the Buddha is really asking us to do is disengage from the pursuit of happiness that is the wrong way. So he's actually saying disengage from seeking pleasure through the five senses, because that's beset with suffering, pain, grief, despair, vexation and fever and all other kinds of terrible words. And he's also saying we should disengage from the pursuits of practices that tire and exhaust the body and mind. So they're the things we disengage from. Whether or not it's necessary to disengage from the world to fully embrace meditation, I would say that it's more a consequence of engaging with meditation. The more we engage with the piece of practice and meditation deep inside our minds, the less interest there is in the outside world. So in my experience, I started practicing in India when I was 20 and I'd never really heard of Buddhist monks or nuns, but then during the retreat, something in me was just lit up. You know, it felt like this was what I'd always been looking for. And I found that after that retreat, it was just natural to start observing the precepts. It was no effort at all. Like I think I said to you yesterday about the music that used to go through my mind, which really kind of interrupts the meditation. It was like a terrible jukebox with all this really awful pop music as well as good stuff like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Um, and it took a long time for that to subside. So there was absolutely no interest in putting more of that in my mind. I much preferred to just sit on the buses with all the local villagers and the chickens and the goats and just be more present to the world around me. And so bit by bit, I carried on meditating and there was just less reason to come out of retreat. I just wanted to deepen the process and find out where this would end. So for me, there was a very clear commitment to the path. And perhaps because I was in Asia and it was almost mm, not normal, but certainly recognized that there was a path of renunciation, you know, that there are these two paths in the world, one of the household life and one of the samana, the renunciate. And for me, that just came alive and I was looking for possibilities to ordain. For some people that might not happen and it might not be absolutely necessary. You know, in the Buddha's day, there were lay people who did attain jhanas or experience, let's say, jhanas and stages of enlightenment. But eventually, you know, when there's no more craving and there's no more aversion left, when you're really close to the final stage, it just makes no sense anymore to be in the world. And so at that point, it would be natural for somebody to disengage completely from the world. So it's more of a gradual thing. And it's something that happens naturally. So I think allow it to unfold and don't uh, push yourself one way or the other. But certainly if you are finding you're less and less interested in the world and more and more interested in meditation, then I think the path's going the correct direction. Yay. Can I add to that? Yes. Once upon a time, there were these two monks. They were best friends. And once they died, one got reborn in a heaven realm where he was having a wonderful time. But then he thought of his friend from the previous life. And being reborn as a heavenly being, he thought maybe he could find his friend in one of the heaven realms. So using his powers, he searched around all the heaven realms looking for his friend. He couldn't find him anywhere. So he thought, ah, my best friend must have been reborn as a human being because that's a very good realm to be reborn into. So he searched all around the human realm, couldn't find his friend anywhere and said, oh my goodness, he wasn't reborn as an animal, was he? So looked around all the animals, couldn't find any trace of his friend. They wouldn't give up yet. Maybe he's been reborn in the realm of the creepy crawlies. <laughs> and then to his shock, and horror, he found his friend had been reborn in a pile of cow dung as a worm. It's a very bad karma he didn't really remember, but his best friend from a previous life 
was a worm in a pile of cow shit. <laughs> and so he thought, I can't just let my friend just live in cow poo. So the heavenly being appeared in front of this big pile of stinky, steaming cow poo and shouted out to the worm, 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 come out. This little head poked out. He said, we were friends in our previous life. We were both monks. I don't know why you've been some bad karma that you've been reborn in this pile of cow poo. I've been reborn in heaven. It's much nicer up there. Come with me and I'll take you to heaven. And this worm in the pile of cow poo said, hang on a moment. This heaven which you talk about, I don't know anything about it. And the heavenly being said, it's beautiful, it's fragrant, it's peaceful, it's wonderful. One thing said the worm, is there any cow shit up there? No, of course we don't have cow poo up in heaven. And the worm said, if there's no cow poo, I'm not going. The cow shit is my home. It's warm and fragrant. It's my food as well. I love my cow poo. Why go up to heaven where there's no cow poo? No way, I'm not going. So the worm went deeper into the pile of cow poo and the heavenly being said, look, if you could only see it, you would know it's much better. But the worm said, no way. And so the heavenly being, this is what friendship does. Friendship is just so powerful that this heavenly being put his heavenly fingers into the pile of stinky cow poo, searching for the worm. <laughs> just like, imagine like, um, like when she was still alive, Queen Elizabeth putting her fingers in the cow poo. Maybe she wouldn't do that. Even though I respect her very much, I think that's a bit too much for a queen to do. But the heavenly being did and eventually found the worm and tried to pull the worm out from the cow poo. But the worm didn't want to go. He said, I'm being worm that, let go, leave me alone, I don't want to go. And because it was covered with slime, the worm managed to escape and go deeper into the cow poo. Many, many times, the heavenly being tried to pull the worm out of the cow poo. But because the worm never wanted to go, it was attached to the part of stinking shit. Because of that, eventually the heavenly being had to let it go and return to heaven alone. And for many days now, it's only two days, isn't it? For two days, we've been trying to pull you out of the cow pool. <laughs> Sometimes we get you so far, what do you do? We get anxious, fearful. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes we have too many questions. But anyway, that's just like that. I've lost the, I've lost the, the um, question now. But anyway, <clears throat> well, it was. Um, yeah, that's right. But that's disengagement from the world. Why not be disengaged from the world? It's much more fun being disengaged from the world and being free. It's like a person who said. What's wrong with being in prison? I get food every day. I don't have to do much work. I'm safe inside there, sort of. So that's the thing, you get used to your pile of poo. Okay, I think I said that about that now. <laughs> Okay, I think you should do that. Okay, I experienced a strong sensation on the top of my head when meditating. I can only describe it like a burning sensation. I haven't read about this anywhere and often wondered what it is. A lot of the time it is uh, just, when you experience it once, it's like the mind associates meditation with that sensation, with that feeling. So sometimes it may be just an habitual uh, contact, uh, connecting meditation with that feeling. If it just happened once, or twice, then, and it was a beautiful burning feeling, like something which created a lot of sense of peace and happiness up there. I'd always say that was a good thing because often in meditation, when you start to let go of your body and get very peaceful in the mind, 
you can often feel these hot spots in your body. Those hot spots are a sign that there's something in that part of the body which needs some healing, needs some fixing up. And when you, you know, basically get out of the way, the energy of your body flows to those areas. In India, we call it you know, the, the winds of the body, the water. And in a Chinese, the qi, just the energies of the body going to places in the body to do some healing. And that experience is like a burning or a hot spot. But you know it's that was the cause because often the afterwards you feel so relaxed in that area after having a hot spot. Look, I'm being quite frank with you. I do do a lot of teaching to people with cancer. And if you have like a, you're meditating, you get a hot spot in one of your breasts, say, welcome it. That's catching a breast cancer before even the doctor can see it and just healing it. Those hot spots are brilliant for your good health. Just to show how much. Oh my goodness, yeah. that's a question. Because doing so, only sending one or two at a time, okay. but actually there's always a lot we don't have. Okay. So. so anyway, I'll do the next one. Yeah, go on. Okay. Is this the only realm where the mind can be enlightened? If so, why are there other realms? So it is not the only realm where delusion can be enlightened, <laughs> because really it's delusion that needs enlightening more than anything else. Um, but it's probably the most conducive. And the reason is because we get fairly decent amount of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it not seem so pleasant to be here but also a bit of happiness as well so it sort of tempts us to think there might be something and yet that happiness is always somehow out of our reach so it's a real kind of mix of happiness and suffering in the human realm and also we have minds that can understand yes and the buddha was a human being so we can understand the buddha's teachings which is a massive bonus but even in other realms as i understand it um, there can be enlightened beings, or there can be stream winners, certainly, even in the Deva realm, isn't it? Yes. And it's possible to be enlightened there, I think, but yes. it's much more difficult because the Devas really uh, re revel in their happiness, and it's only really the heavenly realm. So it's not the pure happiness of the Jhana realm. It's some kind of more refined version of sensual happiness. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they feel it's wonderful and they can even start to feel immortal and that, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to live forever. And then what happens when they start to fade, which is towards the very end of eons and eons of life, they get very upset. And the thing is, if they haven't been practicing the Buddha's path, then all that karma from the past that was maybe less than wholesome is still there. And it can actually send them to the lower realm again. So imagine going from a super duper heaven realm to like the lowest of hells, which is, I don't know how likely, but I think it's possible. Sometimes it happens to me, Ajahn, after I leave Perth. Uh -huh. I feel like I'm in a very nice, slightly higher than the human realm realm. And then I have to come back and do lots of work and be in the cold. And That's right. It's much better to be in England because there's more suffering. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, okay. Okay, so, anyway, so the human realm is very good. And, and there's the why that the other realms are just due to the karma of beings. You know, we put ourselves where we think we belong. I understand the body scan relaxation, but then I find it a little confusing. The instruction just seems to be to experience peace. Oh my goodness, it's much more than that. You relax the body so that you are free to experience the peace. And then once the peace happens, it's a natural phenomenon. It's not what you do, it happens automatically that you start noticing the breath. If it should arise after the finding the peace part, it does anyway. If you do it properly, follow the instructions, you will find that the breath does arise. My mind is often very distracted. If it's distracted, you haven't enough peace. Or I have little to no peace, so I'm not sure what to do. To make the peace first of all. I naturally watch my breath, but I'm now not. But I'm, but I'm now not sure. If you are trying to watch the breath, or you naturally watch the breath, then you cannot be distracted. If you do, the breath doesn't last that long. 
and it vanishes. If you force the mind onto the breath, you do it through like control, then you can watch the breath for sure, but there's no peace and it cannot go deeper into the joyful, blissful parts of meditation. It certainly can't get into nimittas or jhanas or enlightenment. So this is where the creating peace in the mind is a, a very beautiful way, a fast way to create the conditions where the breath can arise naturally and the breath can stay with you naturally. So this is one of the best ways of doing this and also at the same time to create peace in your body. You are practicing the mindfulness and the kindness. And if you want to be able to watch the breath, you have to create mindfulness and kindness. If you want to see these beautiful nimittas, it depends on the strength of your mindfulness and kindness. You're not just relaxing the body, you're building up the power of the mind in mindfulness and kindness, which to then use on the mind to get very deep in meditation. Okay, dear Venchanda, having practiced many years going to Vipassana, <clears throat> I feel uncertain when to practice observing the bodily sensations and when to observe the breath and even mix in metta bhavana. So yes, you're writing this to me because I've done heaps and heaps of going to practice. And um, for me, I used to watch my breath as going to be instructed um, at the beginning of the retreat. And just as Ajahn Brahm has been saying, it was actually quite difficult to stay with the breath. And I used to feel a, a great sense of relief when it got to day four and we could start scanning the body because the mind would engage so much more readily with that. And it was much more interesting to me to investigate and examine the what was going on in the body and to start to understand the mind and the way the mind was reacting to those sensations through that. So it was only much later after coming in contact with Ajahn Brahm and also learning that the Buddha's main teachings and the main practices that he used to gain enlightenment were actually the teachings of Anapana. And that, as Ajahn has just been saying, that the breath is a really refined object and can take you very deep into peace. So then I started practicing the opposite way around. Um, so sometimes I would use the body scan in the beginning of the meditation just to help undermine any restlessness or any hindrances that might be there. And then after that, go to the breath. So I would suggest trying to experiment with both. Another thing I used to do on the Grenka courses was that um, in the really long retreats, like 45 days, I found that there wasn't really enough anapana, and so then I would continue to practice at least a few hours every day of breath meditation. And that in turn strengthened the observation of sensations in the body because really all these practices are just increasing our mindfulness and our peace. So as the wisdom gets stronger, the samadhi gets stronger. As the samadhi gets stronger, the wisdom gets stronger. So really you can't go wrong. But one thing that I did find with um, deepening breath meditation was that I needed to actually move away from observing the sensations as impermanent because whenever I do that it would be really hard to stay with the breath in a very simple way just as breath but rather that breath would start to dissolve you know and it, it again would become more of an insight practice prematurely I would say so if you want to experiment with deepening your samadhi and take it to even deeper levels I think it's really helpful to start learning how to see breath in a very simple way, just as breath, you know, and be aware of um, just the peace with the breath and the joy with the breath, because this is something that's not really taught in the Gwenka tradition. And then that metta can be used in every practice, because metta can be a practice in and of itself, but it can also be an attitude of mind. So nowadays, if I'm doing my body scan, I add a lot of kindness. I had the attitude of metta, the disposition of metta towards the body. And the same with the breath. If you add this metta, this loving kindness to the breath, then this really also helps to make the breath very peaceful and very joyful to be with. And that way the mind can really calm down and start to become empowered in a way that can lead into deep samadhi. So for me, I feel that's the missing piece that was missing with the Goenka system because I practiced that, I would say, as deeply as 
at all possible, really, at least for me, you know, over years and years, at least 16 years and some very intensive years in Myanmar as well. And I found that I came to a plateau and couldn't go much further. So to me, it was very clear from some of my teachers there and also from later meeting Ajahn Brown that to deepen that wisdom would involve deeper samadhi. So that's why I switch more and more to the breath. So I hope that helps, but really it's a very individual thing and I think a lot of experimentation can be done. So don't be shy to, you know, experiment because the Goenka system is quite, you know, rigid and structured. But if you're already coming to these retreats, then yeah, just just experiment and see what really works for you because we're all very different the way we proceed. I'm not different. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old more surprising yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an oxymoron. Does the same advice of programming the mind when fear arises apply to sensual desire hindrance? As a sensual desire appears when I am calm and peaceful in my meditation, especially strong during the retreat. Thank you. If the sensual desire arises when you are calm and peaceful, it suggests to me that you're calm and peaceful, but not enough joy. Uh, in what you're doing in the meditation. The meditation has not got deep enough. Because once the meditation is very deep, the, you haven't got just calm and peace, which are basically the same thing, but you have this wonderful sense of joy as well. You're happy watching your breath say. In many of the retreats which I have taught, many times people miss lunch. They know there's not going to be any dinner on these retreats. They're keeping eight precepts and they're going to miss their lunch. And the reason they miss their lunch is because they're watching on the breath and it's so peaceful and satisfying, joyful. That means that they'd rather, and they do, stay meditating and have their lunch. That is just um, how the mind uh, overcomes essential desire. In other words, the peace and joy of meditation is more rich, more fulfilling than the sensual desire. So my advice is you can try programming your mind if you want to, but it's much better, I would think, to develop that peace into something which is satisfying and joyful. And it's usually the case if you don't reach those joyful meditations, you know, where the Buddha said, pity sukha rising with the breath, then of course the mind will go seeking some happiness and fulfillment somewhere else in the realm of the sensory desires. Okay, dear Ajahn and Venerable Chanda, thank you so much for the privilege of being in this inspiring retreat with you. And thank you for the privilege of being here, of having you here, because it's really wonderful. And it wouldn't be much fun just teaching to an empty screen. Mm. <laughs> Uh, how did the Buddha realize what Nibbana meant as he can't have been returned from it? Thank you for explaining. <laughs> so I think, as Ajahn said, the word Nibbana was already prevalent in Indian culture, and it meant something like the going out of a flame. So it meant like to Nibuto meant to kind of be quenched for something that was there to now be to disappear. Um, so that would be a word that was probably thrown around quite a lot and probably not understood by too many people in those days, because at that time the Buddha's teachings had temporarily um, disappeared. But the Buddha had been with other previous Buddhas in his past lives, and so it's very possible that he already had a sense of what it meant and the sense of which direction the path was going in. So, I mean, this is speculation, but it's very, very probable. I think it's actually true, no, that the Buddha had heard the teachings of other Buddhas. So he's, yeah. So he's bound to have heard things like the Four Noble Truths, that there is an end to all suffering, and that that end is Nibbana. So even if he didn't remember it immediately or what it meant, he had a sense of that. And it was that sense of Nibbana that he remembered when he recollected that experience under the rose apple tree as a child. So even though it wasn't Nibbana, he experienced a jhana as a young child, and that would have given him a sense of the direction of the path. And later on, of course, he called those jhanas Sambodhi Sukha, which means enlightenment bliss. So it was like a, a kind of a signpost of the way of the path. Excellent. Well, I just 
have a look at that Gatikara Sutta because it really changes one's idea of the history of the Buddha. Gatikara was a chief disciple of Kasapa the Buddha. This is in the suttas. And Gatikara also came back uh, to Bodhgaya. Gatikara was reborn in the Yorubos. He was a non returner. And he came back to congratulate his old mate, who was now Siddhartha Gautama, the enlightened Buddha, after his enlightenment. Very inspiring story. So the Buddha did practice under Kasapa the Buddha. And in the first watch of the night, under the Bodhi tree before enlightenment, the Buddha recalled his previous lives. And this was a previous life as a monk with Kasapa the Buddha. You don't just remember these things, you remember the details as well. So the Buddha would have got that what was called Paratagosa, the words of another, you know, from that memory under the Bodhi tree. And when my mind gets really still, this lovely light appears and I relax into it. Well done. It gets brighter, beautiful. Then this really strong energy comes up. Great. And I feel as if my body was too weak to contain it. It may feel that way, but your body doesn't contain it. It's not part of your body. It's, you know, just this is part of the mind. And that mental energy, that mind energy can get so incredibly powerful, but it can never damage you. Sometimes when I remember seeing these lights and they get so much brighter than the sun, and I thought, I'm going to go blind. But then I realized this is a mental image. It's not seen through the physical eye. And so I just carried on. And so I'm being honest with you. But sometimes the, the joy, the bliss was a bit too much. And I thought, no human being can take so much bliss. You're going to explode. But trust me, you can take so much bliss and a bit more as well. So basically, if you trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Make that trust and faith and confidence in what I say and what, other, uh, what the Buddha said. It may appear powerful. But don't be afraid. The fear only try, tries to make you control it, and it just goes all haywire. The strong energy comes up, feels that your body was too weak to contain it. Don't even think about the body. Think about the mind. And that can contain that and so much more. It's really good stuff. Carry on. You're doing well. And I don't think you will regret letting that energy come stronger and stronger. Next question, just to show that there's suffering and happiness everywhere. <laughs> so far, I just feel dull and empty, apathetic and a bit sad and irritable. Usually I can get peace in meditation, but now it's very hard. It isn't fatigue, I've had plenty of sleep. I struggle to do metta. I know that retreats aren't necessarily all bliss and joy, but am I doing something wrong? I would say, no, you're not doing anything wrong, except perhaps you're looking for peace when what's actually asking for your attention is dullness and apathy and sadness and irritability. Because it's always the things that most need our attention that come up. So there's nothing actually wrong. Remember Ajahn Brown's simile of the driverless bus. It's not that we're doing something wrong. It's just that the bus is now going through difficult terrain. And everybody has to go through difficult terrain. Sometimes it's even more difficult when we think, oh, I'm on a retreat and this is not the right time to go through difficult terrain. But I mean, it's not up to us when that happens. And actually a retreat can be a wonderful time to make peace with those things. So I would definitely not struggle to do metta because sometimes we have to be careful about why we do metta. And sometimes we do it to try and make things go away. And then that's not really metta. So real meta is actually including everything. It's opening the heart to whatever arises. So I would say use meta more as a way to relate to what's there and as a way to comfort yourself and just give yourself some encouragement and some care. Yeah, because now you're suffering. I mean, imagine if that was a friend who was suffering, feeling dull and empty and all those things. You'd want to just like put your arm around them or tell them, hey, you know, this is gonna pass. Don't worry about it, just relax. And it's only the second day. You just don't know how things can change. 
if it's any help, I was pretty irritable yesterday because I hadn't slept and I was feeling really tired. And then today, I'm fine. Actually, it's just hormones playing around. And I think it's good to say that for any other women around my age, because sometimes these things are physiological. We don't really know why. And it's beyond our control. And when you realize that and when it passes, you think, gosh, why didn't I create? Why did I make such a fuss about it? It's always when we own these things that the problem's there. So try not to own all this sadness and irritability, but just treat it kindly the way that you would a child who felt the same or a friend. So I don't think there's anything wrong there. Okay, sometimes when I get very relaxed at meditation, when I get out of it, I feel very sleepy. It can last for a long time. Some other times in meditation, I feel as someone has opened a tap and suddenly feel a lot of fluids coming to my head. When that happens, I get headaches afterwards. Any advice? Thank you for this online retreat opportunity and for all the teachings. I'm very happy to be here. Sometimes when you come, you get relaxed in a meditation, you come out, you feel very sleepy. That usually means there was some sloth and torpor there. You feel like you're relaxed. But if you really are relaxed and peaceful and the real good energies come out, then afterwards you never feel sleepy. Often after a really nice meditation, you can't go to sleep at night. You don't want to go to sleep at night. You don't need to go to sleep at night. You're full of energy and it lasts for a long time. This is natural, not dangerous at all. And so you get very relaxed in meditation, great, but also get the energy up. This is that pity sukha I keep talking about. Because when that energy comes up in meditation, you know that you are still and peaceful because you don't feel sleepy at all. You feel like alive and energized. And open up a tap and suddenly feel a lot of fluids coming to my head. That's a bit weird. Uh, and you get headaches afterwards. It's when I first went to teach in Malaysia, a lot of the retreatants there, they were complaining about Samadhi headache. And I was just really surprised by that because that. I was always taught and practices, practiced, and so other people practice. You meditate to overcome any headaches. If you meditate peacefully, you get this beautiful energy inside of you, and headaches just don't happen. So I think one of the things which is happening, can you go back again? Yeah. yeah. One of the things which is happening, uh, fluids come into my head. I think you may be trying too hard because that's usually where the headaches come from. People try to concentrate, which is one of those words which I really argue very vehemently against. Because meditation is not about concentration. Concentration is what you do. It's a force. It doesn't create peace. And also samadhi does not mean concentration. Samadhi means stillness, and you cannot get stillness through force. So have a look at how you're meditating. If you really are uh, being still, then that's usually a very delightful state, and headaches just cannot come up. Okay, a couple of nice comments here. Um, just wish to say I'm very grateful to both of you for this wonderful retreat. Hope next time I can come to a normal retreat next year. Yes, well, um, it's quite difficult now for me to organize a retreat next year because we lost our booking for next year as well in the same venue. We actually had Ajahn all lined up for next year and now we don't have a venue. So <laughs> anybody who knows a venue, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll definitely have something somewhere. So Paul says, I miss the giggling chanting. Oh dear. Sometimes Ajahn does that if I'm in a retreat and I say, <laughs> I've, I'm losing my sense of humor. I've got no one to laugh with. And then he just starts laughing like this. And it just is really yeah. it's so hilarious. Anyway. Why not? So the question is, can you achieve jhana through open awareness meditation? 
So I guess Ajahn would say he's sitting right here. He so we don't achieve it, yeah. <laughs> first of all. But I would also say that in a way, I mean, that's what we're doing, isn't it? When we start with present moment awareness that you could call open awareness. It's basically being aware, being kind, being present with whatever's arising. And it's certainly a first step. But eventually the mind has to come to the place where everything starts to calm down and it tends to, yeah, calms, disappears and tends to focus in by itself on one thing. You say yeah. more about that then, because you know yeah. more. It, is, it doesn't focus in, it just falls into one thing. Mm. And as it falls into one thing, it's similar to like you've got a magnifying glass and all the energy goes in one place. And it gets very powerful, very bright. Very blissful. Excellent. You can do that one too. Okay. Sure. You do that one. Adding kindness to mindfulness at guided meditation sessions in, in the morning helped me quite a lot. And I had a wonderful meditation. Well done. At one point, when the breath had disappeared, the bliss filled in my head almost like exploding or pouring out. Sounds good. <laughs> then a small thought came, now what to do? Oh, don't spoil it. What to do next? There is no next. It's what you're doing now. Relax even more. Let it be. Another, now what to do? Another a bit annoyed thought. Don't question. Be in the moment. That's much better. Don't be annoyed. <laughs> By that time, the bliss started to dilute fast. Ah, I felt the breath again, but still, the rest of my meditation was joyful. Brilliant. Later in my other sessions, I tried adding all the ingredients, i.e. being in the present moment, being kind, but don't get that experience again. What are the tools for not getting involved or too excited when things like joy comes with meditating? One of the best uh, pieces of equipment is having that experience you do meditation again and again, you make a mistake again and again, but then you learn from your mistakes. And soon you get this trust. And when the joy comes up, you don't need to uh, interfere with this. My job is to keep teaching you about that. So it's not a surprise to you. And you realize that excitement is spoiling something which is so beautiful. You don't get excited. Be at peace, and the bliss gets even more. Can I just add to that as well? Yeah, sure. When that's happened to me in the past, and yeah. I've told you about it, I also thought I've blown it. Yeah. But you said, um, yeah. that's par for the course, and that really yeah. helps. Yeah. Because I think what's happening here as well is you are learning. You know, you have noticed what you did and what the result of that was, and that is just part of the process. So, but it's the trying to put it all together again that's uh, going to lead to frustration. <laughs> I think it's just trusting, you know, trusting in your own inner wisdom and virtue and trusting that your mind knows the path. Okay. Thank you so much. Can we have interferences from devas and spirits from other realms when we practice the path? If so, how can... We practice the path. No. So how, how can protect we, others? How can they protect or guard? Oh, how can uh, other people or how can we protect or guard ourselves from such interferences? Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, virtue. If you're a good person, then the only interferences, so called, that you're going to get is help from the devas. I would say the devas are going to rejoice in your practice. They're going to come and hang out in your kuti. They're going to even fill up your vihara, hopefully, in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> oh where's it gone um and the spirits if there are any spirits that want to disturb your practice they won't really be able to get in there was that story about that lady in the hospital you yeah said, no no the worst spirit you tell that? no i could have told oh. for everybody to know there's right. a very bad spirit around oxford <laughs> it's called the bottle ghost <laughs> and it's very prevalent around christmas time it lives in bottles of whiskey and rum and gin, and then if you can't, if you drink some of that, you can't meditate at all. That's why we call those things spirits. <laughs> the bottle ghost. <laughs> so please avoid those spirits, and they're real. Yeah. 
but it's true that if you are a good person, a moral person, spirits just, they, they can't get close to you. And heavenly beings, if there are devas around, oh my goodness, you get some incredible good meditation there. And some good food. Yeah. Sometimes they interfere with your arms food. I'm quite sure about it. <laughs> yeah. Which is really okay. nice. All right. Uh, yeah, that's a perfect message, but somebody's recommending a particular place to hold the retreat. We'll be in touch. It, I don't know if it's big enough, honestly. I, as far as I understand, it's about 30 people. <laughs> we need uh, bigger than that. But we can definitely explore. This is the thing with most places. Okay, let's read this one. Oh, is that? Yeah, these are all direct messages. Yeah. It's delightful to be part of the retreat, still more in this newborn Anukampa Vihara. I feel so grateful to you for sharing this wonderful and inspiring teaching. Excellent. It was inspiring to listen to the simile of the bus driver. May tonight you have a wonderful rest. <laughs> Thank you for your fresh, happy presence. Looking to meet you soon in person. Yay! That's from a very old friend <laughs> who practiced together with me in Myanmar. So that's really wonderful. And I'm so glad that you're enjoying all these teachings and Ajahn's wonderful wisdom as well. <laughs> and may, maybe you can come and visit me here along with other people too. Maybe not all at once. I can't imagine that happening. But anyway, bit by bit, I would like to see you all. <laughs> okay. Do you want to do that, Ajahn? Okay. Do you not recommend any form of noting while watching the breath, for example, rising, falling, or counting? First of all, the idea of saying rising or falling in the Satipatthana Sutta, that's not what they teach, watching rising and falling. If you look at the Satipatthana Samyutta, where these words are explained in more detail, this is still the word of the Buddha. It means finding the cause for the body to come into existence and how it can disappear. Finding the cause by weight and experience come into existence and how it disappears. Finding the cause why the jitter comes into existence and why it ceases. These are just cause and effect, and so it's it's quite sort of um, against the teachings of the Buddha to call it rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. Where, where have I got? The um, it was just about noting. Oh yeah, the... and just noting. You may try noting with the breath, sort of, you know, in, out, or long breath, short breath. But when I tried to do that as a young Naples, you know, they said, well, just do a, a long breath. I didn't know what a long breath is, because most of my breaths weren't long, weren't short, or somewhere in the middle somewhere. And the Buddha never taught that. They said, what's the long breath? What's the short breath? What about when the breaths were not long, not short, in the middle somewhere? It got very confusing. So it's much better. Noting can be a skillful means, but only the very beginning. The trouble is once we start that verbal function of the mind noting, it can actually keep going on and spoil the piece of our meditation. Let's go. Thank you for your other suggestion. I know the place I was there with Ajahn. Um, oh, but uh, okay. anyway, we'll see, because we want to do it in England ideally. We can always see the backup plans. Um, we're almost out of time. Shall we? This yeah. one's kind of bigger one, which we can do another time. Yeah. Maybe yeah. tomorrow, how to build up mindfulness and kindness. I mean, this, this is what we've been teaching all the time yeah. here. You're more mindful, more kind of things like your body, and you find that it works. You get healthier, then you're mindful and kind to something like your breath when it comes up and it becomes much easier to watch. You are building up mindfulness and kindness on this retreat, whether you realize it or not. Or not. Okay. Should we do just this one last question? Yeah. I don't know if there were more, Derek, because no, no. Wow, no. we finished all the questions. This is Maybe. brilliant. So let's go for this. Do you want to do it? Okay, okay and you can add. Okay. Is smoking cigarettes against the fifth precept? No, it's not against the fifth precept. It doesn't mean because it's not against the precepts, it's okay to do. So still, I mean, why do you want to smoke cigarettes? They're bad for your health, and really very bad for your health. 
even if not, I feel like on some stage of meditation path, I need to get rid of this craving anyway. Fair enough. I've been smoking cigarettes uh, for the last 20 years. I have tried quit many times. I feel shame and hopeless because of that. Now that's a problem. It's a shame and hopelessness there. Many sort of addicts, not just cigarettes and drinking alcohol or other drugs, it is they don't feel good enough. They don't think they almost deserve to quit. So you need to you know, be in a community like Anukampa, just like being a friend to it, and coming to those retreats. And then you know, some other kind of Ayachanda would say, oh, it just doesn't matter. You're still, you can come to Anukampa. You can come on a retreat, even if you smoke, but if he's not here. And don't feel shameful and hopeless because of that. Try to be kind to yourself. That's brilliant. But what is not under my control? One of the things you can do if you want to overcome that uh, cigarette smoking is try that programming of mindfulness. I shall not uh, pick out that first cigarette. I shall not pick out that first cigarette. I shall not pick out that first cigarette. What usually happens is that it's a habit. And the cigarette's out of the packet and you've lit it before you even realize it. So if you make it more difficult, more troublesome to take that first cigarette out, in other words, the cigarette packages are not uh, near to you, and you have to do more to actually to take it out and to light it, all those different actions give you more opportunities to stop and say no. You get depressed, frustrated, and sometimes feel very scared when I cannot feed myself from addiction. That's, you know, don't get depressed. You know, many people smoke cigarettes. Even Ajahn Chah smoked cigarettes. It's only one day someone told him it's bad for, for you, so he just stopped. That's an Ajahn Chah. But he did that because he didn't know any better. How to react to very similar experiences during forest retreat and also this online retreat. Just try your very best, but even if if you keep smoking, people like Ajahn Mahabur who smoke cigarettes, and many monks smoke cigarettes in those days, simply because you know, they didn't um, realize it was bad for your health. It's not a big thing. Yeah. The feeling so frustration, depression, that's a bigger thing. So then it's about acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. Why don't you accept and you know, kind to yourself more? You know, you find it's easier to abandon, to let go of the the uh, cigarette. Mm. I'm wondering as well if if you've tried to quit many times and you haven't succeeded, that there's a little bit of beating yourself up about that. Yeah. And because you're beating yourself up, you know, your mind is kind of almost punishing itself <laughs> because you don't like yourself very much. I wonder if some more meta and love Loving kindness may also help, like really embrace and accept yourself like that and forgive yourself. You know, you can also do forgiveness practice for yourself. Like, may I forgive my weaknesses? May I accept them fully and wholeheartedly? May I love myself just as I am? May I offer myself kindness, genuine kindness and care? And then just see if you can relax with the practice and relax with yourself. And then who knows, you know, if you find yourself smoking a little bit less, great. But if not, it doesn't matter because you still experience your own care and your own kindness, you know? So maybe try and take some of that pressure off because in the end, the Dhamma will help, you know? And the more that you practice meditation and find happiness there with loving kindness rather than self-hate, then the less you'll need to smoke because you'll be more relaxed and at peace within yourself. So I would maybe take the attention off the cigarettes and onto something else that's going to nourish you and help. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Excellent. So I think we finished. Yay. Right on time. Excellent. So thank you very much to everyone for your beautiful practice and yeah. presence and questions, etc. And yeah. thank you to Ajahn. Thank you to everybody. <laughs> to all beings, may all they all be happy and well.
and may all cigarettes be extinguished. <laughs> may all cigarettes. Nirvana first. <laughs> okay. Sadhu. 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 Good night and remember to practice metta. And see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, bye.